Christmas. I hope you had a great Christmas day. I'm excited that you've taken time to be a part of church online today. And as always, however, whenever, and from wherever you're joining us, I'm so glad that you've taken time to be a part of today's service. Hey, before we jump into the message, I wanted to let you know a couple of things that are coming up. One, our annual 21 days of prayer and fasting begins Sunday, January 9th. This is the time where we as a church set aside the first 21 days of the year to seek God with everything that we have. We'll meet Monday through Friday from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. and Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. All of that will be available to stream online and we will meet in person at our Times Square location. Hey, begin asking God now what it is that he would have you fast and give up during this time as we come closer to God. Secondly, I want you to go ahead and save the date for Friday, February the 4th. This is our first ever Two Strong Marriage Night. This is a night that we are devoting to helping, enriching, and blessing the marriages in our family. We've invited our overseers, Pastors Joe and Lori Champion, to come speak into our lives. It will be a powerful message and a powerful time of worship, and we'll have a lot of fun throughout the night as well. So go ahead and save the date, Friday, February 4th, and we'll have more information for you in the weeks to come. All right, all that aside, today we want to show you the most popular message from 2021. That's the first message in our series in February, Love Thy Neighbor. It's a message that never gets old and is applicable at any time of year. Enjoy the message today. All right, all right, all right. So good to see you this morning. You enjoy worship? Such a great time. Love that. Love our team. And I love what God's doing here in our church. I'm excited to kick off a new series today, Love Thy Neighbor. i tell you what, before I do that, I want to do a couple things. One, I just want to look straight into the camera and say hello to our church family online, let you know how much we love you and we pray for you and for whatever reason that you're out today or whatever reason you're connecting with us online, we hope to see you in person real soon. But thank you so much for making time to be a part of our church uh, virtually online. And then while I say that, I just want to thank you all for being so generous that has allowed us in this past year to pivot into this because two years ago we were meeting in a movie theater and we didn't have any of this and now we've been able to connect with you maybe even some of you are here because you connected with us online and checked it out first so thank you for doing that thank you for your generosity and God is doing great things in our church before I get one more thing before I get into the message I just want to make a personal appeal to you guys in two areas Uh, One is we kicked off our small group semester last week. We do 13-week small group semesters. So it started last week, and it runs through the first weekend of May. And if you haven't already done so, man, I'd love for you to go to our website and check out our small groups directory. We've got over 20 groups that are available for you, men, women, families, uh, married couples, uh, students, and just anything. There's some that are online. There's some that are meeting in person. So you can check it out online, or we'll have our team in the lobby after the service. There's an iPad or two out there, and we'd love to connect you to one before you even leave today, because I know this is true in my own life, and I know it's true for many of you, that life change happens in the context of life-giving relationships. And if you don't have any, can I tell you what, our church is more than Sundays, and you're missing out if you're not in a group. So even if you don't do it this semester, it's some point in your journey, jump into a group and find some people who love God, love people, and go on the journey with them. And if you're here and maybe it sounds a little scary to jump, go to somebody's house tonight or throughout the week, my wife Angela and I, my wife Angela leads worship and she did such a great job. And um, yeah, I know somebody wanted to clap, but I'm not going, it's not a, it's not a gratuitous moment. She, um, we're, we're hosting a group here on Wednesday nights uh, called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, and it's a little bit of video base, and then we'll break up into groups in the room as well. So there's room to spread out if that's a, if that's a thing for you right now. Uh, and then it's a great opportunity to connect. So maybe you're not ready to show up at somebody's house, but maybe you want to step in here and be a part of that with us. I invite you to do that Wednesdays at 7 o'clock. And then also, if you're here, you're new to the church, and you have students ages 6th through 12th grade, my wife Angela and I are leading the students group, too. And we'll be working hard at Church of the Pines, okay? Uh, we're hardworking pastors. 
And we know in this season, it's just a privilege for us to invest in our young people. And that's happening at our house uh, for 6th through 12th grade from 5.30 to 7 o'clock on Sunday nights. And that information is available on the small group directory as well. So we would love to have your students come in and be a part of that. So the second thing I want to say, that was all one appeal. The second appeal is, and then we'll get into the message, is uh, next week is our third anniversary. And we're, you can clap for that. We're so excited, and a lot has changed. For those of you who have been with us from the beginning, a lot has changed over this past uh, year, but it's our third anniversary, and we are fired up about it. And normally, I don't tell you when I'm not preaching, because what tends to happen is, if I tell you I'm not preaching, then you decide that's the week that you don't want to come to church. But what we try to do, if you've been around long enough, is the weeks that I don't preach, I always try to bring somebody in who's better than I am. And that has never been more true than it's going to be for next Sunday, for our anniversary Sunday. I'm, I'm not preaching. We, we have the privilege and the honor of bringing Pastor Dino Rizzo in to preach our anniversary message. He's fired up to be here. He can't wait. He actually asked me if he could come do our anniversary service, and I said, absolutely. So Pastor Dino is the executive director of our church planting organization, ARC. And, uh, man, he's been all around the world, and he's been on some of the biggest platforms in church world, and, and he is not afraid to come step on our platform, and we are honored beyond belief. So, hey, help me honor him and celebrate our anniversary by being here. Nine o'clock, we got, we got more room than this in the nine o'clock service. So if this is a little tight for you, come at nine o'clock. There's a little more room in that service. And let's pack it out. We got gifts. We're going to have fun. We're going to celebrate what God's done over the past three years. It's going to be a blast. So anyway, what I say, don't miss it. Be here. All right. I'm through with the appeals. Now I'm going to appeal to you from God's Word, which I know is really why we're all here. So why don't you join me in prayer, and we'll jump into week one of um, Love Thy Neighbor. All right, Lord, we love you so much. We're so thankful for your goodness, and uh, Lord, just thank you for your presence. Lord, that regardless of what we see and regardless of what we feel, Lord, we know that your word says that where two or three are gathered, Jesus said you would be there in the middle of us. So I thank you that just by your word alone, we can know that you're here today. Uh, thank you for experiences so far. And Lord, I ask you, as we prepare to open your word, that you speak plainly to us today, that you just speak to our hearts beyond even the words that come out of my mouth, Lord, that you touch people's hearts today because we know it is your word and your presence that has the power to change our lives. And so we open up ourselves to you today. And as we do that, we pray this prayer together out loud. Pray this with me, dear Lord. Those things I don't know, teach me. Those things that I haven't seen, show me. And those things that you have prepared for me, prepare me in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, look at your neighbor and say, hey, are you still glad you came to church today? And then look at the other person, your second choice, and say, hey, I'm so glad you took a shower. <laughs> Aren't you glad I took a shower today? Absolutely. And some of you are like, uh-uh. All right. Enough silliness. Mark. Our theme, uh, our theme verse for this series is out of Mark 12. Now, most of you, if you've been around church for any length of time, you're familiar with love thy neighbor. And you can find it really plainly in the same language in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So we could have easily chosen any one of those stories to kind of share this message out of. I've, I've chosen to share it out of Mark. So, again, you could go look up those other references in the other books of the Bible. But I chose it out of Mark. And in this passage, what we see here in Mark chapter 12 is that the, the religious leaders of Jesus' day have come to Jesus to test him. They love to test him. Can I tell you, religious people always love to test you to see if you know as much as they know. Mark, sorry, I'm not trying to meddle, I promise. I'm going to get through this. Uh, Mark chapter 12, so they come to test him. And they ask him this question as a test to him. They say, hey, Jesus, what's the most important of all the laws of all the commandments? And Jesus gives him an answer. He says, the most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. They asked him for one. How many of you know sometimes Jesus could be a little extra? And in this moment, he was a little extra. He said, hey, you asked me for one, I'm going to give you two. And the second one, he says, they only asked for one. He says, and the second one is this, love your neighbor as yourself. 
You asked me for one, I gave you two. You said, what's the most important commandment? And I tell you that there is no greater commandment than these. The greatest commandments. I know we're familiar with that. And, and I know maybe when you think about that, maybe you thought about that like I have over the past. I, I'm not a Bible scholar. I just, I just love to read my word and I love to dig into it a little bit. But something about Jesus saying this has kind of always led me to believe without digging into it that these were like commandments one and two on the, on the Ten Commandments. You know, you see the Ten Commandments, and you got five on one side and five on the other. And I always kind of, when we talk about it like this, I always felt like that those were the one and two. And a couple of things I've discovered. One, they're not, and some of you probably already knew that. One, they're not one and two on the Ten Commandments. Something else I learned is that the Ten Commandments didn't have five on one side and five on the other. You know, the Ten Commandments were actually spelled out and written on both sides of two tablets. So it's funny how we can picture things and see things and kind of let, let common culture dictate to us what that looked like when that's not even what it looked like. There were ten commandments written out on two sides of two stone tablets, and these that Jesus quoted weren't on there. That Jesus, in the moment when the Pharisees asked him what's the most, in com com the most important commandment, it's almost as if... And I don't have all the answers to this, and honestly, I don't know that anybody does. But in that moment, it almost seems like Jesus cherry-picked two commandments out of 613 laws and commandments out of the Old Testament. There were 613. And that may sound like a lot to you. You may kind of blow your mind. 613? How could they ever keep up with all that? Well, to put it in a little perspective for you, uh, in American law currently, we have like 5,000 regulations and laws just at a federal level and then once you combine all the regulations that go along with those and then the state level and local levels there's tens of thousands of laws that are in place in our culture today and something else i learned is that we are 18th on the list of the amount of laws globally like there are 17 other countries in our world that have more laws than the united states does this kind of blows my mind so so really when we sit here and think about six 613 sometimes we'll think about the old testament god we're reading through leviticus in our one-year bible and we're like god how could i ever keep up with all this stuff you know actually i think they had it easy they didn't have as many laws as we do but jesus takes these two and almost kind of just pulls them out of thin air a little bit they asked him he pulls them down and he says there's no greater commands than loving god with all your heart all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And he said, and there's no greater command than loving your neighbor as yourself. And when you look at the law, the Old Testament law is broken up into really three main categories. The first one is civil. That there's the, the civil categories, that, that these are the things that, you know, most of what our law today is made up of, of, of civil matters. So an example of that would be don't move the boundary stone of your neighbor's property, which to us is like, you know, kind of over our, our head a little bit. You may not know what that means. I actually do. Because just to let you know a little bit about me, my wife and I on TV, we watch English murder mysteries. I mean, we, we don't watch, watch R-rated movies, and we don't watch a lot of shows on television. We don't like a lot of that stuff, but, you know, we're just kind of suckers for a, a period piece, the murder mystery with accents. And it just does something for me. And there was actually this one, it was like in Greenland somewhere, and, and it was subtitled. And one of the episodes, somebody was murdered, and the reason that they were murdered is because they, it was discovered that they were moving the boundary stones. But you're still thinking, what's a boundary stone? We know back then they didn't build fences. So they didn't, they didn't get their plot of land and put a nice little picket fence in there. You know, they didn't have dog-eared high fences. They didn't have high wall fences like we see all through the hill country keeping their, their livestock in. They just had to mark boundary stones of where the edges of their boundary were. And what happened in this episode of this show is that when they compared the map of the property over the last hundred years, somebody had gone and moved the stones in a little bit more so that a little bit over time, the, actually the property that they owned shrunk and they didn't own as much, so they killed somebody over it. That's what happened in the show. But that's, that's an example of civil law, that, that, that a lot of the commandments in Leviticus... They, they, they had to, don't murder anybody, don't steal anything like that. So civil commands. And then some of them were ceremonial. 
These are just things in, in, in worship and sacrifice to God. This is what the priest was supposed to wear. This is what part of the cow you're supposed to use for sacrifice, and this is the part that you're not supposed to use. You know, just ceremonial stuff just in their religious worship, just things that they were supposed to do and not supposed to do. And then there was a third part that was moral, the moral laws, the moral regulations. And what I came to understand as I studied this and meditated on this is, one, I was reminded that God knows more than I do. Anybody, is that newsflash for you today? Maybe you needed to be reminded. God knows more about stuff than you do. He knows. And what I've realized in this story is that the, Jesus didn't just cherry pick two commandments out of, out of the, just out of the universe, out of, out, of, out of his brain, and just say, hey, this is the first two things I could think of. Jesus knew something that they didn't know that the religious leaders are asking him what's the most important commandments because the way they're thinking about their worship and, and the commandments is all in line with what they're doing at the time. That their way of life and their way of worship and their communities and their cities and their temples would be completely annihilated. Within 100 years of Jesus going to the cross and dying, Jerusalem was completely destroyed and the Hebrew and Israelite culture was scattered around the world. You know how long? Israel wasn't remade and recognized as a nation until 1967. That their way of life, their sacrifice, their, their civil laws, I'm submitting to you today, Jesus knew this that their civil laws and their ceremonial laws only had about 75 more years of use. Because once they were scattered and, and sent everywhere, th these, weren't, these weren't appropriate anymore. They don't do it like that anymore. And Jesus knew that if there's one thing that was going to sustain them, one thing that they needed to lead them through all of the things that they were going to go through, the answer to it was going to be love. That if you're going to go through and walk through and live the life that I've called you to live, you're not going to be able to do it with your ceremonies. You're not going to be able to do it through your civil law. Come on, somebody. How many of you know the law is not going to make this? It's the morals. And I, I didn't say this earlier, but I'm going to say it right now. That's what's happening in our culture. That's what's happening in our, in our world. Is that we continue to try to make civil laws to, to correct and overcome what is a moral issue. And we can't allow the moral decay of our society creep into the church and dictate how we're going to follow. Because if we allow that to start creeping in, love's going to leave. And Paul tells us in the, in the, in the passage about love, he, he talks about spiritual gifts, and spiritual gifts are great. I love spiritual gifts. And he talks about faith, hope, and, and love. But there's going to come a time when all that's going to go away and be unnecessary. But there's going to come a time when you don't need wisdom, there's going to come a time when you don't need knowledge. There's going to come a time when you don't need uh, faith, right? Because you're going to see God face to face. There's going to be a time when you don't need hope because you are in the presence of God. But love never fails. You know why? Because God is love. And if we're going to succeed on this journey, if we're going to be the men and women in the church not just Church of the Pines, but globally, the Big C Church, if we're going to be the church that God's called us to be, it is going to be first and foremost through love. So may our love affect our civil laws. May our love drive our ceremony. But if we do it without love, Paul says, I'm like a clanging cymbal. I am nothing if I don't have love. And I want to start here. I know we're calling it love thy neighbor, but the Bible is a manual for relationships. And we can't succeed in any of these other relationships if we don't first understand how we are to love God. I think big three, big three relationships that we see that, we are, that the Bible teaches us to love in, it teaches us to love God, teaches us to love ourselves, and it teaches us to love others, love thy neighbor. And before we can really hone in on and understand how we're supposed to love our neighbor, we first have to understand how are we to love our God. Once we understand that, we have to understand how we love ourselves because if, we, if we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves, hey, i got to get that right. How many of you know, some, some of you don't love yourself, and it's hard for you to give what you don't have. So we'll talk about that, and then we'll finish the series on how do we take all that, put that together so that we can love our neighbor God's way. And I want to submit to you today that all of this, 
our love for God, our love for ourselves, our love for our people, and this is the title of today's message, it begins at home. It begins in the house. When we take this passage that Jesus, Jesus actually quoted, it wasn't the Ten Commandments, Jesus actually quoted a passage out of Deuteronomy chapter 6 when God was giving Moses, telling Moses to tell the people what to do. Moses gives them these commands and he's kind of laying out what they need to do as they get ready to take, in, take the promised land. And this is what Jesus, is, Jesus quotes, and we see that in Deuteronomy chapter 6. I didn't give it to the team to put on the board, so it's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and on. So write that down, make that a little homework, go study it a little bit yourself. I'd love for you to do that this week. But this is what, Jesus, this is what Moses says, Deuteronomy 6, is word for word what Jesus said. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strengths. So that's what Jesus said. Hey, that's the greatest thing that you can do. That is the greatest commandment, is to love God. But Moses didn't stop there. Moses tells us what it is that we need to do. How how do we do this? How does this play out? And Moses gives us this instruction that it can't just be something that we come in and do on a Sunday. It can't be just something that we go to a small group. It can't be something that we just do once a week. It can't just be a religious observance, but it has to be a lifestyle. So we see that in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Read that, verse 5, love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your strength. And listen to what he says in verse 6. Moses says, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. So we got to get it in here. The goal of the word of God is not to get it up here. The goal of the Word of God is to get it down here. So we've got to meditate on it. He says, put them in your hearts. And then he says, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. I mean, you know, sometimes we look with the forehead. That's not what I think of every time I read that. Bind it on your forehead. Am I even doing that the right way? Is it? My name's Les. And that's, it is for me. It's bad for y'all. All right. Put it on your forehead and write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. It starts at home. Can I, can I, can I say something to you with a big smile on my face and, and as much love as, as I have for you in my heart right now that you are, and if I make real eye contact with you, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to point you out. But you are no more spiritual than you are at home. You are no more spiritual than you are at home. How you spend your time. The first commandment, the greatest commandment, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And can I tell you, that doesn't start in a church service. I'm glad you're here. And I hope God speaks to you and you experience something incredible. But if you don't cultivate this at home in your own time, you're never going to experience the fullness and the the life that God has called you to. It starts at home. And that's that's what Moses tells Israel in the early days. Hey, this thing that God's done in you, this thing that God's called you to do, hey, these laws and commandments, these regulations that I've given you, hey, you got to get them in your heart and you got to talk to your kids about it. Impress them on your heart so that they'll follow them, so they'll do them. Because it's not just about you, it's about them. If you want to love your neighbor as yourself, you've got to start in your own house. You've got to get your house in order. And that starts with getting yourself in order. You've got to love God. And that love that you have for God, that time that you spend with God, that devotion that you give to God, man, that will get upon you. We talked about this at prayer yesterday. And it'll be God, God will work down you and move in you and touch your heart in such a way that it just spills out and oozes out into everybody else and you just can't help it. Just can't help it. That's what God wants to do. So how do we do that? Like, I'm not just here today to tell you, you know, y'all been to that church before. You better get right. You better get right right now or you're going to hail, right? We're in East Texas. It's like two, it's like two syllables. And there's two syllables. I don't want to do that. I want to give you some suggestions today. How, how do we cultivate this God first? How do we cultivate this? If I'm going to, if, if I'm going to love myself and I'm going to love others, first I got to get this thing right and love God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, and with all my strength. And how do we do that? 
I, I got to get away this past week with some pastors from all over the country. And one of them, really, this is just fresh to me, just gave me some things that he said, if you have these three things in your life, you will never go wrong. If you keep these things forefront in your life, you, you, you will succeed. You will go far. And I, I want to share these with you today, that if you want to grow and you want to spend time with God and you want to love God with everything you have, three things that you need to do. And one is you've got to have some humility. Humility. We love that word, don't we? Got to be humble. Got to be humble before God. Because if you can't be humble before God... Again, we'll never be humble in front of anybody else. That, that we go low. That in your prayer time, in your devotional time, can I tell you, it is okay to go to God and say, I don't know. And a lot of times we like to go to God and we like to do a lot of talking. But I think God would prefer that we come to him and say, I don't know, and shut up and listen. I said shut up. I didn't mean to say shut up. I'm sorry. <laughs> that we go humble because the truth is he knows. And I think one of the biggest disservices we can do to our own spiritual growth and to our relationship with God is act like we know and go to God acting like we know and tell him everything that we know. And he's like, (laughs) because remember, he knows. We already talked about he knows. He knows ahead. He knows more than you know. And he is waiting to talk to you about it. But we've got to admit and come to a place where we can just look at him and say, I don't know. Help me, I'm humble. And then when you put yourself in that position, in that posture before God, think about how that affects everything else. Then that humility, if you can be humble before God, then that works in you, your ability to be humble before your spouse. Be humble before your children. I I did a a leadership, I do a leadership devotional every day, and recently one of them was talking about, you know, leadership and how, you know, you got to be humble as a leader and all that stuff. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, humble. we got to be humble. Being humble. And it said, uh, what's one thing that you can do in order to be more humble as a leader? And I'm not thinking about the church. I start thinking about my family. And I start thinking about... That, that saying that every one of you as a parent has said before, when your kid asks you, hey, why? You say, because I said so. And that seems easy in the moment. But I think if you're like me, the reason I say because I said so is because I really don't know. Because I don't have a better answer than that. And if we can bring ourselves to a place of humility, that place of humility will help us think for a second, hey, I, hey, I don't know. <laughs> Let me get back to you. And that way, when your kid starts asking you questions, you don't have to go thumbs down, keeping them down because I said so, but you can actually have a given it some thought and kind of tell you that's going to change. And then when you respond to them humbly and with that attitude, they're going to respond to you humbly with that attitude. And then you see this humility, this, how this love for God filters down and affects your home. That we got to be humble before one another. Peter, 1 Peter 5, 6, he says this, he said, I got it right here, 1 Peter 5, 5 through 6, he says, Hey, young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Then this is a little extra. I didn't include this, but I thought about this this morning. I'll share, with, share this with you. You know what the next verse is? Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. You think there's a connection between our humble attitude and our anxiety? That I think sometimes our anxiety gets so bound up because we're trying to do it all ourselves because we think that there's something that we can do to control it. When Peter, right before he shares that, he says, hey, humble yourself under God's mighty hand that he can lift you up in due time. If you've got anxiety in your life, it's probably because you're trying to do something out of God's timing. And if you just stop for a second, humble yourself and let God work it out for you, you wouldn't have all that anxiety. Come on, I'm preaching about 75% better than you're responding right now. (laughs) That's just a little extra. James says it like this. He says, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. He will lift you up. So if you humble yourself before God and you come to your family like that, hey, I'm humble before God. Lord, help me be humble before my family. And when you give a suggestion to your spouse, 
they might listen to you. When you encourage your kid or your child, you're trying to get them to do something and you come to them with a humble attitude instead of an authoritarian attitude, they just might not just do it, but they might actually want to do it. But it starts with us modeling something different. Again, Moses said, hey, these things, this love for God, hey, live this out in your home. Impress this in the hearts of your children, this love for God. So number one, we got to humble ourselves before God. That's how we love him. The second thing we got to do is we got to honor We've got to be humble before God, and then we've got to honor God. I love this passage. We used to have this song we sang back in the day out of 1 Timothy 1, 17. It says, all honor and glory to God forever and ever. Y'all know that? To the King eternal immortal. Y'all know that? Come on, Chris is like, don't sing less. All right, I'm not, I'm not singing. You want to come up and play that one? <laughs> anyway, all glory and power and honor forever and ever. Come on, that's how we come to God. That we recognize I'm coming to him, that he's got all the power, he's got all the glory, and we give him all the honor. How, how do we give him honor? We, we put him first. Like he's the king of the unseen, the eternal. Every, everyone else is going to die and fade away, but he alone is God. And we honor him for who he is. We honor him for who he is. Because he knows. And sometimes we go to him and we're, we like to talk. I've already said this. We like to talk. And we like to say a bunch of stuff. But he knows that what's coming out of your mouth isn't always what's in your heart. How many of you know we can give lip service that is in direct contrast with what's in our heart and how we're feeling? And Jesus knew that. He said, there's a people and their lips praise me, their lips honor me, but their heart is far from me. We come to God in humility. God, how do we love God with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, and all our strength? We come to him with humility. We come to him with honor, recognizing who he is. One way that we do that, I said, is by putting him first. Thinking about Proverbs 3. It says, hey, put God first. Honor the Lord with your wealth. Now, we're not talking about giving. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. But he says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits. Everybody say first fruits with the first fruits of all your crops. So one way we honor God, one, it's not with our lips. We've got to make sure our heart's in line with our lips. But then we can honor God by putting him first. We put him first in our finances, Proverbs says. We put him first in our time. Bible says several times that Jesus got up very early in the morning and went and spent time with God. And I'm not saying you've got to do it first thing in the morning, but I can tell you you need to do it first. Even some mornings when I get up a, a little late or I, I'm running out the door, the, I promise, and I'm not super spiritual and I'm not bragging on myself, but what I do is I roll over first thing in the morning and I think, Lord, I love you so much. Thank you for this day. Can you just, I mean, it's the first thing that you do before you get to the coffee pot, before you get up, before you get the kids ready, that you're just, how you do, your mind is focused on him. Your heart is focused on him. That I love you. I want you first in my life, first in my time, first in my marriage. And I honor you because I know if I honor you and I'm putting you first, then, then that puts me in a position to lead my house well. Because if I'm not leading my house well, I can't love my neighbor well. If my house isn't in order, I am useless in the rest of this world. I'm just telling you. And then the third thing is holiness. But if we want to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength, can I tell you what it looks like? It looks like humility. It looks like honor. And then it looks like holiness. And can I tell you, Jesus saved you for holiness. Like, I don't know what you think God saved you, and I don't know what you think Jesus came to provide for you, but 2 Timothy 1.9 tells us that God has saved us and called us to a holy life. That's a life that's separated. That's a, that's a life that's different. That's a life that doesn't say yes to everything. That's a life that doesn't do everything. That's a life that honestly doesn't agree with everything. It's holy. It's set apart. It's consecrated. That God has called you to holiness. What, what is holiness? I mean, it, it even says it in the word. It's, it's whole. That I'm trusting God to make me whole. I'm not looking to my spouse to make me whole. I'm not looking to my employer to make me whole. I'm not looking for any relationship to make me whole. I'm looking to God for wholeness. And what, is, what does he look for? For us to bring that to him. That he, we can't do it outside of him. So we're submitted in humbleness. We're honoring that our, our lips are connected with our heart. And we're putting him first. 
And then that empowers you to live a holy life, to live a life set apart, to live a life that that lives for the things of God, that doesn't live for our own pleasure. He says, not because we have done anything, but because it's of his own purpose and his own grace. And this grace was given to us in Jesus before the beginning of time. Paul says it like this in Romans. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Jesus knew this. Jesus actually said this to the woman on the well, the woman at the well in John. She says, hey, God, you guys, you Jews are worshiping on the mountain. She says, but you tell us we can't go worship on the mountain because we don't look like you. Jesus said, hey, I'm going to tell you this. There's a time coming, and now is, when true worshipers, they worship in spirit and in truth. And I believe that's what Jesus is saying in that moment, that your best religious worship, your best personal sacrifice, your best devotion, he just wants you. He wants you close. He wants you near. I'm glad you're here, but this is just a part of it that we pursue a holy life. And before we can go out, we want to change, we want to change the world. I mean, social media has given us an, a voice into everything. And many of us feel like that's our, that's our lane. No, it's not. Maybe it is, I don't know. But I do know this. If you're here today, you look around at this world and you see a need for change. You look around at your neighbors, you look around at the laws, you look around at at culture, you look around the things that you're saying, you say, this isn't right. It shouldn't be like this. Why can't we get this right? Today, you can only change the world by changing your world. It starts here. And we're going to get into some other things about how we change the world and how we love our neighbor. But again, we can't love our neighbor until we receive and understand and walk in our love with God, with our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. This is what I thought we would do today. Because I don't know how you came in. You know, we always start with three songs of worship, kind of expecting that everybody came in ready to give it all they got. and, And maybe you missed that moment. Because you came in with something heavy or you're, you're here for the first time and you're like, I'm just checking this out. And I, that's great. You come to this church, you sit back there, you kick the tires for as long as you need to. That's, that's the way this church is set up. But today I just want to encourage you and give you an opportunity to take this moment to position your heart to live this way. That we can't, Chris can't play this dulcet, dulcet, tone on this acoustic guitar for you every day we, we can't bring this into your house every day for you you've got to learn to cultivate this for yourself and today I just want to invite you to stand with me why don't you stand with me and we're just going to spend a minute in worship and I just want to encourage you let this moment let this song let this opportunity let this be not not just this moment But let this moment be a springboard for you on how you share your time with God. Let this moment be a springboard for how you you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Don't, Don't let this just be something that we lead you in in this moment, but let this be something that we lead you in to take you home, to take home with you. We're just going to sing Build My Life. And I mean, it comes on 500 times a day on Christian radio. It's not hard to find. Take this song. Take, take any song and just take the time to humble yourself before God, to honor Him, not just with your lips, but your heart. And to develop a lifestyle of holiness. So Chris is going to lead us for a moment. Hey, why don't you just close your eyes, open your arms, posture yourself to, to give Him right now all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength in worship. There is no one like you 
There is nothing beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those of I will build and I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not Come on, be holy. shaken. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder. Show. heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I just want to take this holy moment because there's probably some of you in here, I don't know wh where you've come from, but maybe you've never, you've never entered into a relationship with God. Like you've never humbled yourself before him. You've never, you've never given Jesus your whole heart and your whole life. For us in a word, it's just surrender. You've never surrendered your life to him. Jesus came, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for our sins. God raised him to life after three days so that we could live the life that Jesus modeled for us and spend eternity with him in heaven. And I want that for each and every one of you. And if you're here today, I want to give you the opportunity to say yes, to surrender to Jesus in your life. So if you bow your head and close your eyes and you're in here today and you need to say yes, hey, right there where you are, will you just lift your hand? We're not going to call you to the front. We're not going to bring attention to you. We're all going to pray a prayer together out loud. So right now, just be bold. Lift your hand and say, I need to say yes to Jesus in my life today. Awesome. So awesome. Best decision you've ever made. And why don't we pray this prayer together out loud. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. I believe today that he died on the cross for my sins. I believe today that you raised him from the dead. And today, I confess Jesus as the Lord of my life. I humble myself before you. I honor your work in my life. And today I pursue holiness. Thank you for working in me. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, let's celebrate decisions in life change. And you can be seated for a second.